Welcome to the show. Tonight, catastrophic swings against Queensland Labor in two weekend by-elections. But the Federal Environment Minister says it's a message she didn't need. We don't need to be told that that's the, the most important job for a government, is to be aware of what's uh, really critical for people. Also tonight, more shocking evidence that Palestinian extremists are influencing Aboriginal ones into talking now about terrorism. We have every right to become terrorists of these colonial occupations. Plus, I'll expose the Iranian liar, a fake refugee, a fraud, a criminal in detention, who could force the government to free another 150 foreign criminals. That's our understanding. Between 100 and 150 hardened criminals, further hardened criminals, to be released into the community potentially. And China's foreign minister calls in former Prime Minister Paul Keating, a pro-China propagandist, for a meeting during the Chinese foreign minister's Australian visit. Should Keating refuse this attempt to divide Labor and our country? Meanwhile, in Russia, dictator Vladimir Putin wins another rigged election despite protests at the ballot box against this war criminal, including the burning of votes. But first... You might think the Albanese government has already done its worst in destroying business, destroying our wealth. But you'd be wrong. The worst may yet be to come. A disaster for our future. 1,000 pages of new green laws and explanations called nature positive. And that means three ministers now, all of them wanting to replace Anthony Albanese's prime minister, are all going flat out to smash business. Now, two you've already heard from. One is climate change and energy minister Chris Bowen, of course, whose net zero crusade on global warming is destroying our electricity system. Bowen's plan to save us from the non-existent climate crisis is to get rid of our coal-fired generators and replace them with wind and solar. But there's a big problem. It's true, as destroying coal-fired power is easy. That's going out of business. But not one single new wind farm went ahead last year to replace them. In fact, private investment in Bowen's clean energy revolution has cratered from $6.5 billion in 2022 to just $1.5 billion last year. So Bowen is destroying coal-fired power generators but not building anything like enough to replace them. What we're seeing is the de-electrification and de-industrialisation of Australia by a government that's making electricity such a scarce luxury that whole industries could be wiped out. Now, the second minister smashing business is Workplace Relations Minister Tony Burke, who's uh, rammed through one pro-union law after another, crippling the ability of businesses to manage. She's private contractors, for instance, loading them with extra costs and regulations. And all this is when... Our productivity growth is now terrible, absolutely terrible. And when Australians last year got 1% poorer per capita on average. We needed all that like a hole in the head. But now, a third minister. The third minister who's about to make new investment in Australia, especially in our resources and new gas and coal mines, even harder. In nuclear power too. Or anything on Aboriginal land is Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek. She's pushing now an international agenda called Nature Positive. Our government is getting on with our goal of delivering a nature positive Australia. Plibersek's claim is that despite all the green tape we have already, all the environmental laws we have already, all those those green restrictions that are strangling investment in coal and in gas and in fracking and in oil and so much more, still aren't enough. Australia's environmental decline is a direct product of Australia's poor environmental laws. Now, Plibersek's solution, she has said, is about 1,000 pages of new laws and explanations, whatever, 1,000 pages. But relax, let me sum them up. This is a plan for even more green restrictions and Aboriginal cultural protection rules that will make it even harder to open any new factory and especially any new mine. Plibersek claims all this is actually going to be good for business by 
speeding up decisions, making things clearer. But everything she's actually hinted at, every specific during a highly secretive consultation process, sounds more like a threat and a big one. For instance, Plebiscic or a department's official map of what it intends says we have to get tough on global warming policies and force investors to first work out all the emissions their business is going to create and cause and, and disclose how their project aligns with this Australia's national and international obligations to reduce emissions. Now, just can you imagine the horrendous paperwork, the costs, etc., etc., the hoops? But this nature positive agenda, this bundle of laws, proposed new laws, goes much further. Plibersec also wants improved protections over fracking for the gas that we actually badly need now, even though multiple state inquiries have said the risk of any contamination of groundwater, for instance, which is the main concern, is low and it's manageable. Naturally, she's also pushing the government's anti-nuclear hysteria, which includes an irrational ban on nuclear power. Plibersec, though, through a department, wants her nature-positive laws to also have an extra focus on protecting the community and the environment for the harmful effects of radiation and radioactive material. Where on earth is that danger right now that we're not protected from already? Who's walking around, you know, nuclear reactive right now? Tick, 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 tick. I mean, seriously. And finally, and ominously, Plibersec wants more race politics. New laws, her department says, to strengthen First Nations cultural heritage protections nationally. And you've got to ask again, is Tanya Plibersek blind? Hasn't she seen how activists have grossly misused our existing laws, citing mythical rainbow serpents, for instance, to block even massive gas projects way out at sea, claiming that Aboriginal song lines will be disrupted, and how the animals are complaining about this? What is going on here? What is happening? We've got animals, plants that are telling us there's a major issue going. Well, how about the debacle over Western Australia's cultural heritage laws? So restrictive, so abused, they had to be scrapped within months. Does Plibersec really think we need even stronger ones nationally now? Yet Plibersec and her department, they're doubling down. They're suggesting that under their nature-positive laws, species that are of cultural significance to First Nations people be considered in environmental and heritage protection processes. And she's also demanding that the unelected members of her hand-picked Indigenous Advisory Committee be given a stronger voice in our system of environmental protection, even though many of these unelected people also, by the way, have substantial European ancestry, but they identify as Aboriginal. So add it all up. The government's global warming crusade is green religion, it's race politics, plus the wildly pro-union laws on business. The damage being done to our economy could last the generation. Labor's ideological crusades, they're going to come at a terrible cost. All that. All that faffing around, you know, with laws making it even tougher to start a business and open a mine, create wealth. Well, Queenslanders on Saturday just gave Labor a massive wake-up call and a massive scare too. State and federal, they don't want to be poorer, these Queenslanders have said, and they don't want to feel unsafe as well. And on Saturday, voters in Queensland turned against the state Labor government in two by-elections in two supposedly Labor-safe seats. Uh, gigantic swings, 90% against Labor in the seat that used to be held by Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk, which Labor still managed to hold on to, and an 18% swing in Ipswich West, which it lost, shocking the new Premier, Stephen Miles. I was expecting a bad result, and they're even worse than that. Clearly, they wanted to send us a message that we need to work harder, particularly on cost of living and on community safety. Joining me is the panel, Michael Kroger, former Victorian Liberal President, and Steve Conroy, former Labor Senator and Cabinet Minister. What does this mean, this result, Michael, uh, for the state Labor government, the Queensland government, but also the, the federal Labor government? Well, the Queensland Labor government's a goner. They're um, going for fourth term, very hard. 
But uh, the coalition needs to win a Liberal Party 12 seats, I think a bit over 5%, swing 5.5%, which they're going to get. Uh, this bloke's a hopeless Premier. Uh, he's got a PhD, did you know, Andrew? In? I, 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 trade unionism. <laughs> Yeah, well, it could have been women's studies, so, but anyway. Well, well, so this bloke's out of his depth. Christopher Foley's been very good. Christopher Foley's talking about things people are interested in, like youth crime, which is out of control. So this government's going to get kicked out. Christopher Foley's going to win, uh, I think, in October. And no federal uh, implications? Federal implications? Oh, definitely. I wonder whether Queensland has said to the Labor Party federally, we have reached peak woke in this state. Enough. Enough of this nonsense. Can you get on to things like youth crime? Can you get on to things like cost of living in Queensland? Uh, I think they've had enough. So the two green seats, which they won from the Liberal Party at the last election, are at risk. And a few other Labor seats are at risk. Blair, etc. I think, is at risk. So they're not going to win any in Queensland and uh, it's going to Although, help drive Labor into a minority government. Well, peak woke. I'm not quite sure the Queensland government has been peak woke itself. But anyway, what do you make of that? No, look, I think it was, you know, if we're being frank, a very disappointing weekend for Labor. I think it does send very loud alarm bells ringing in the Queensland branch. But... I, I think Michael, who's always been very much correct in his analysis, going for a fourth term is very, very hard. So to those who want to say suddenly the issue that's caused this, these results were all this youth crime, let me be clear. The last two elections, the Liberals have tried to turn youth crime into an issue. It didn't work then. No, it's but the not Premier the himself, now. the Premier himself well, because said he's going to have to focus on yes, that. Yes, and, and he should. Right. But in terms of has it moved the dial for two previous elections, no. Is it something oh, that should I be dealt with? Bit, it, so look, you Labor can't Party, deny he hasn't Labor Party very well. won seats, OK, in the face of the alleged mm. crime epidemic. But my point fundamentally is this is a bad weekend, a disappointing weekend for Labor. Federally? Federally, I think Michael's, again, fair analysis. I think at least one of those two seats, Ryan, if I was the Greens, I'd be very nervous about Ryan. Uh, but in terms of we've only got five seats, uh, it's it's pretty hard to do much worse than that. We have been one and two in the past. Yeah. I accept that. But the... Except the cost of living, of course, is a national yeah. focus. And this seems to be the big takeout but a, but a yeah, a from point both in, sides. But a point in time, 12 months' time, cost of living will not be bearing as heavily as it is today, as Dunkley We shall showed. see. Mm. Yes, but we shall see about that. There's another state election, uh, Michael, uh, in Tasmania. Um, that's uh, with Liberal Premier Jeremy Rockliffe who's called an early election there later for this year. What do you... Uh, oh, sorry, later for this year. It's on mm. Saturday. What do you expect there? Well, he's going for a fourth term. <laughs> so he's not going to win a majority in his own right. Uh, it's going to be a hung parliament. I expect he will cobble together a government with the independents and Lambie. And the reason I think he'll be able to do that, not Labor, is for Labor to win, they need to have an agreement with the Greens. They need to be in coalition with the Greens to win, to be in government. No Labor government now can ever get into bed with these anti-Semitic elements in the Greens party, as evidenced by the woman, Jennifer, Jenny Leong, who made those disgusting anti-Jewish comments the race baiting of the Greens, their their involvement in anything which is anti-Jewish in in recent months, uh, some of the comments their people have made. No Labor government can be formed in coalition with the Greens, and that's why in Tasmania Labor probably can't be in government because they cannot formally have an arrangement with the Greens. Well, uh, Jenny, uh, she did apologise for that, oh, Jenny yeah, yeah. Leong, and said you know, <laughs> the comments were something about. Tentacles of Jews yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. spreading Polter. elsewhere, and she didn't mean. She blah, still blah, believes blah, them, blah. probably. Yeah. But anyway, do you, how, do, you, do you see that? that no, I think the, the Labor's going to be hurt by any relationship with the Greens. Well, I think the Tasmanian Labor Party learnt a long time ago when they did have a coalition with the Greens that they'd never do it again. And if you talk to any of the colleagues down there, it's we are never forming a coalition with them. They may vote for us to keep us in government in a, in a mm. if it was just the two, uh, but Labor won't ever form a coalition, just like I doubt they would form a, a formal coalition in any way, shape or form in Canberra. So I think Michael's point's right. Fourth-term government, going for it. Mm. And to, But uh, I'll give Rockliffe credit. He couldn't. He wasn't. He was sick of being blackmailed by rogues who quit the party. He said, "I've had oh, enough. Oh, absolutely. I've had enough. 
uh, and I'm calling it... Another example of people getting elected to Parliament, yeah. whether they're on the Labor ticket or the Liberal ticket, and once they're in, they think no, no, they're a bit so bigger I, than I, the, I give him credit. And it may cost him majority governments, but it is better to be in a minority government than being blackballed by your lunatics Correct. from your own party. Correct. 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 Can I just stick with you for a sec? Paul Keating, right? I know you're a China hawk. Um, We've got China's Foreign Minister, Wang Yi, coming to Australia this, this week. He's invited Paul Keating to come and meet him probably on Thursday, knowing that Paul Keating is a pro-China shill, I'll say that, uh, very aggressively pro-China, very anti the, uh, the Albanese government, claiming it's too soft on China. Mate, is that appropriate for, our, for Keating well, to go well, there? Is he already accepting look, the invitation? There's, there's lots of politicians who come here on official business from different parliaments around the mm. world to catch up with people. So is it some sort of outrageous uh, thing that happens? No. In general, in this issue, what it again demonstrates is China want to play and interfere in Australian politics. That's the point. That's, that's the that's point. What they want doing. to make him a catch and if, ball. And if Paul Keating is dumb enough he is. to go to a meeting and then continue to spout their propaganda, well, we'll all be able to easily judge him. So you're saying, don't go, what are you making? Of course he shouldn't go. I mean, he's being used. He's being time. used by a hostile communist dictatorship to divide and dominate the Labor government and, by extension, the country. I mean, how could a former Prime Minister conduct his own independent foreign policy? The only good news out of this is that the Liberals are not the only party these days where rogue... Where former prime ministers on our side have gone rogue. Uh, the, oh my God! Uh, don't compare the list because I think the Liberal list uh, is much longer. <laughs> oh, the, Malcolm Fraser. It must be the Malcolm uh, name. Uh, it's true. To, it's true, to, it's true to some, one. It must be uh, something about the Malcolm name. Exactly. Indeed. Uh, Steve Conroy and, and Michael Craig, thank you both so much for Thanks, your time. Adam. After the break, oh, dearie me, Vladimir Putin has just won another election. When you go to see how he did it. You might not think that... Uh, well, I think the word dictator might spring to mind after this. And if you believe Russian dictator Vladimir Putin, and I do mean dictator, if you believe Russian dictator and war criminal Vladimir Putin, he's just won another election for another six years as Russian president. And he won it with an amazing, unbelievable, truly unbelievable, 88% of the vote. I would like to thank the citizens of Russia. We are all one team. Now, I guess 88% is the kind of result you would get when you make criticising your war in Ukraine a criminal offence, when you have just killed your main opposition rival, Alexei Navalny, when you have arrested or silenced many others, when you've arrested protesters against you, when you censor newspapers and television stations and you engage in massive vote rigging. But there were signs this time of an anti-Putin protest that this made-up vote tally didn't tell. I mean, you had women uh, protested by putting ink, pouring lots of ink into ballot boxes to spoil other ballots or even setting ballot boxes alight. Many voters held a silent noon against Putin protest that Navalny had OK just before his death. But turning up at noon on the last day of voting, and then how could police arrest voters, turning up and then... Not voting. In polling stations in Russia and at Russian embassies abroad, huge queues of people doing this. Now, this is Germany, where the Russians there chanted anti-Putin slogans and cheered Alexei Navalny's widow. Joining me is the country's top foreign affairs writer, Greg Sheridan of the Australian newspaper. Greg, Putin elected for six years by 88% of the vote uh, of Russians. Do you believe it? And what does it mean for the world? <clears throat> no, well, of course I don't believe it. I think you had a brilliant idea off air, which he might have chosen 88% because <laughs> it's an auspicious number in Chinese. So, 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 well, it's got Chinese... Uh, he depends very much on Chinese support, so maybe he wants uh, uh, absolutely. to... Absolutely. No, the, the vote is an obscenity. And... Um, uh, and his humbly thanking the voters reminds me... I can't remember if it was Chairman Mao or one of the North Korean dictators who, uh, according to the state propaganda, played his first round of golf in his life and hit every ball as a hole in one. 
and then swam up the Yangtze River. I think it was Chairman Mao. It's Mao. Mao. He swung, he swung the, in world record time. In world record time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I don't think these dictators even expect people to believe it. They just are showing you their power. It's but like making you say you believe it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's it's like Big Brother in 1984. Yeah. You know, they just, the, the ability to say two plus two is four is what defeats the dictator. And, uh, exactly. If an, and if a dictator can make everyone say 2 plus 2 equals 5, or in this case 88, 88. Um, brilliant. That just uh, shows who's the boss. Um, Putin is killing and is rigging his way to uh, election wins like this. Uh, he'll be the longest serving, he serves out this term, longest serving Russian leader in 200 years, beating Joe Stalin. Uh, meanwhile, this is the leader of the West, the free world, President Joe Biden. Have a look. That Netanyahu should go. I don't admire Putin's methods one little bit, obviously, but is that man and the West generally strong enough to outlast and outfight Vladimir Putin? Well, Andrew, it's a fair question. Um, I've got a column in tomorrow's paper outlining how all the AUKUS partners, the US, uh, Britain and Australia, are cutting their defence capabilities, cutting their defence budgets. And, you know, Grant Shapps, the British Defence Secretary, says we're living in a pre-war time. Joe Biden says how perilous the competition with China is. Our own government says it's most dangerous strategic circumstances in 80 years. But all of our societies are so addicted to welfare payments and... NDIS and insanely expensive green energy transitions and all the rest of it, they're not going to spend on defence and they don't project any vigour. I mean, I think um, our, our own government has, has gone quiet on China, won't say boo on China. Won't say it. And won't, won't answer Paul Keating. It's uh, all of I our governments in cheat. different Have ways. Have they said nothing on the Paul Keating thing? Well, not today, I think. And, and normally, last time he abused Penny Wong and Albanese, they got Jim Chalmers to say... All that he said was, I think Paul is wrong. He still enjoys my friendship, but I think he's wrong on, on Penny Wong and Mike Burgess. But they won't make the argument. I mean, Bob Hawke defeated the anti-Americans and anti-nuclear people of his day by taking them on and defeating them in argument. Him he enjoyed and it. Beasley and Bill Hayden. That's right. Whereas Albo, he's kind of got into a fetal crouch and he won't say boo to a goose and he just says nothing. And they think this is statesmanlike, but what they're doing is... They're not defending their basic strategic It shows position. they have no courage. Well, talking, let's talk about that goose, Paul Keating. I talked earlier how he's going to have a meeting, a private meeting, with the Chinese Foreign Minister, Wang Yi. Wang Yi's got an even higher title now, councillor or something, um, in Sydney, when Wang Yi knows that uh, Paul Keating has been attacking the Albanese government for being too hard on China, what a joke that is, uh, saying we're all wrong and China's not a threat. I mean, he's running an alternative foreign policy as a former Labor Prime Minister. This is totally inappropriate. Yeah, yeah, I think it's disgraceful by Keating, truly disgraceful for a Prime Minister to oppose his own government on a matter of national security and connive with the uh, antagonist government. But, Andrew, I want to make this point to you. Wong Yi knows exactly what he's doing and he is kicking sand into the face of the Albanese government. He's come here to humiliate... No, you're wrong. I thought it was all friends uh, now. He's They're come friends. Here. Just as when they called Albanese a handsome boy, they knew that this was a humiliating and degrading term. So now they are saying, yes, we're going to welcome you Australians back now that you admit the error of your ways and we are going to embrace your most vicious and aggressive and contemptuous critic who talks of you all the time in tones of contempt and contumely, and we're going to say what a wise and wonderful man he is, and we know this is going to overshadow our meeting with you, and we're doing this to show you who's boss, and my guess is the Albanese government will just say thank you for coming, God bless you, please lift our wine tariffs, and that'll be it. What has this government actually got out of crawling to China? Because it is a crawl. Kimberly Kitching was right. When the last conversation I had with her before her untimely death, uh, the former Labor senator, what a loss, what a terrible loss, was exactly that. I said, uh, can, you, can we trust this uh, Labor government to be, incoming Labor government, to be tough on China? She said no. For the first six months, they were pretty good, but then they completely lost their nerve. I think... The voice did them a lot more harm than we think, losing that referendum. And the, they're very conflict-averse. 
Richard Miles, who, you know, talks like Dick Cheney in private, he obviously has no traction or influence in the government whatsoever. It's an Albanese, Wong, Katie Gallagher, Jim Chalmers oh, government. It's, it's essentially just... a Labor left government. And even when they recognise that someone like Keating is talking complete rubbish. They won't have a, they won't have a so, fight about it. Well, that's because they're scared in part of what Keating might do. And, of course, Albanese is an admirer of Paul Keating. I mean, oh, my God, it's all tribal. Greg Sheridan, thank you so much indeed for your time. Thanks, Andrew. After the break, the Albanese government could be forced to release up to 150 more foreign criminals on our streets because of a liar and a con man from Iran. I'll tell you all about him this foreign crook who could make us even more unsafe. Plus, now an Aboriginal activist inspired by the war against Israel talks terrorism here too. I'll show you that frightening footage after this. I'm going to show you the lying con man, complete bull artist, a criminal from Iran who could next month inspire the High Court to release up to another 150 foreign criminals on our streets. But first, here's a quick look at what's coming up on Sherry. Thanks, Andrew. Well, tonight I've got exclusive details on a major snub by Anthony Albanese to the intelligence chiefs, how they've been removed from a key national security body. I'll have those details and more at eight. Now, the Albanese government's immigration fiasco could get even worse. It's already set free, as you know, 151 foreign criminals from immigration detention, including murderers and rapists, after the High Court said it couldn't keep holding people who couldn't be sent back to their countries. But on Friday, the government gave journalists a secret briefing saying, oh, no, the High Court could next month force it to release a lot more foreign criminals who could go back home but refuse to go, refuse to cooperate. We're talking a lot. That's our understanding. Between 100 and 150 hardened criminals, further hardened criminals, to be released into the community potentially. Now, this is actually crazy because it comes about because the High Court has been asked to hear an appeal involving an Iranian criminal who came here illegally more than a decade ago and it's since claimed to be first a refugee on the grounds that he is supposedly a, uh, a Kurdish a minority member facing persecution in Iran. Then he claimed he was a Christian. And now, that didn't work, he claims he's bisexual and Iran hates him. His wife caught him in bed with a man. Plus he's committed a crime here, refuses to go back to Iran. Now if the High Court lets this man stay and sets a principle then 150 also simply refuse to go home. In my respectful opinion, the law then is an ass. Joining me is veteran immigration lawyer Simon Jeans of Jeans Lawyers. Simon Jeans, first of all, thanks for your time. Is this Iranian an out-and-out -out liar? Uh, well, yes, and, and don't, I don't often say that, but it, it's not just the, the Department of Immigration who found that. It's a, a federal court judge, Justice Colvin, and he's a, a very substantial figure in the in the federal court, and his judgments are, I find are quite reliable. And he had a hearing in December, and this man gave evidence in the hearing, which is unusual in these cases. And Justice Colvin found that he lacked almost complete uh, implausibility. So he found uh, no, he was not uh, a Christian. He was not a genuine convert to Christianity. His claims about having to escape from Iran were all made up. Uh, and even the claim that he would really, really like to go to some other country apart from Iran was also uh, rejected. It was found that really he just wanted to stay in Australia. Is he a serious criminal on top of that? Well, at the moment we don't know because all we know that is that he's, he's arrived in, in, in Australia by boat one of those people under the Rudd legacy of open borders uh, in July 2013. And then he committed, he was arrested in February 2014. But the, the current records, the court cases, don't say whether he was convicted of an offence uh, or, or yeah, anything or whether he's been in prison. All we know is that since February 2014, his, he's been in detained, whether at a prison or an immigration detention centre. 
And of course, on the bisexual front, the judge did point out, hey, how come you've never mentioned this ever before in the decade here? I mean, seriously, um, why can't we make him go home? Well, there was a, a, an agreement between Australia and Iran back in about 2019. What they came up with was that from 21 March 2018, the uh, Iranian government would not accept anyone who arrived here before that date from they were Iranian citizens. So all those people who came, by, whether by boat or air, they would only be accepted if they voluntarily returned to go home. So if they're not voluntarily, if they don't volunteer to return, we cannot deport them. Iran will not issue documents and will not accept them. And it's not just these people. And, and I suspect there's more than 150. I think it's probably more like at least 200. But there's actually thousands of other people who came by boat from Iran. They're not refugees. They don't agree to go home. But unlike this character, they've, they've, they've formed businesses. Uh, they're employing Australians. They've got married. They've got Australian citizen children. So eventually, and I think it'll be sometime next year or the year after, the government will have to resolve this. And this is all the legacy of Kevin Rudd. Now, the idea is uh, he's only in uh, immigration detention because he refuses to go where he should go, back home. It's on him that is in detention. So take us to the High Court hearing next month. Could the court seriously then rule that any foreign criminal like this man, this is the case that's before the court, who refuses to go home and can't be made to, must then be freed into our streets? Uh, yes, I, I think the High Court could release him and they could make a decision on, on the day of the hearing, just like they did in that the Burmese case. Remember Mr NZYQ, but it's easy to remember him as the Burmese case. And th because they didn't, the High Court glossed over the fact that he was in detention or prison uh, because of a serious criminal offence. All they did was look at the, the current reality and the current reality was they couldn't, we couldn't send him anywhere. We couldn't remove him. And so in the case of this Iranian, the, the fact that he's got into this situation by, by either committing a crime or, or, or not agreeing to voluntarily return, but still at the end of the day, the reality is we, we can't remove him anywhere. There's no country that'll take him and we can't send him to Iran. So it could go either yeah, way. But Simon, just as Colvin he can went go one way, but the High Court could go I know, as you say. Oh, yes. Yes. He can, well, he can get on a plane tomorrow. And go, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> It's, let, let the High Court just say, mate, if you want to leave detention, there's the door and there's the plane. You can leave any time you like. But for it to make a ruling that uh, this guy should be freed onto our streets is ridiculous. I'm Jeans. Thank you so much for taking us through that. <laughs> oh, what Australia today. You wouldn't think, by the way, Talking about another idiocy, that we just held a referendum where 60% of, of Australians just said no to the whole racist woke agenda, that Australians with Aboriginal ancestors uh, are so different to the rest of us that they need their own advisory parliament, they need treaties, the whole enchilada. Yet Victoria's version of The Voice, its so-called truth-telling body, uh, is gearing up for its final hearings ahead of negotiations with the state government over a treaty. Now, meanwhile, this separatist push is getting even more dangerous on the fringes, which is encouraged by this kind of talk treaties and all that kind of stuff, and it's whipped up as well by Palestinian extremists. I've already shown you on this program several times how Aboriginal flags are now flown at pro-Palestinian protests, how prominent campaigners like the Aboriginal head of Get Up are saying, yes, the Aboriginal Palestinian causes are alike, but bit by bit, this reckless rhetoric is being ramped up and it's spreading because I now want to show you Mohammed Sharab, who's a Palestinian activist, recently arrested on unrelated charges. He is speaking alongside Kieran Stewart Ashton, who may surprise you, identifies as Aboriginal, as is the way now, and is president of the Black People's Union. Listen to this. The colonial entities are going to call us terrorists. And, you know, at the end of the day, to them, we might be terrorists. At the end of the day, like, you know, if we're being honest, we are. Because we're terrorising the colonial systems. But the colonial systems shouldn't be here in the first place. They shouldn't be in Palestine in the first place. They shouldn't be anywhere in the world in the first place. We have every right to become terrorists of these colonial occupations because 
they have spent how many decades now terrorizing our people and occupying our land. Any sort of you know terrorism that we might commit is justified resistance. It's legally justified under international law, and it's justified morally, and it's justified ethically. They label us as terrorists. A chant. We haven't even started the, the proper resistance um, action yet. We will. Join me as the panel, Federal Liberal MP Garth Hamilton and Steve Chavura, Senior Lecturer in History at Campion College and co-author of Reason, Religion and the Australian Polity. Garth, where is this separatist movement going? Well, I hope it's going nowhere fast, Andrew. Uh, look, I've just come back from a trip uh, into Israel where I've seen this separatism play out in the worst possible way. And to hear someone trying to justify terrorism to suggest that they have a right to be a terrorist. Uh, this is some of the most awful language, and I hope, beyond hope, that we do not see any further incursion of this uh, into Australia. The idea that what is happening in Palestine is somehow relevant to what's happening in Australia um, is just you know, beyond any comprehension. Uh, what I saw over there yeah, but when was you got a thousands... hatred being incited. Yeah. Yeah, well, when you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of Australians on the street legitimising what happened to Israel, the terrorism there, uh, can you uh, wonder why one Aboriginal hothead activist saying, well, you can call me a terrorism, but a terrorist, but, you know, terrorist, uh, terrorism could be justified. Steve Chavira, well, what do you make of what's going on? Isn't this the time for our Labor to, to do something about this? Isn't this time for our Prime Minister to stand up and say this is not acceptable, this <laughs> is not the Australian way, and we do not accept these uh, statements? So yeah, true. I mean, Steve Chavira? I mean, this, where is it going? Well, where are all Marxist rhetoric and Marxist movements going? And when you listen to these guys, they are just parroting critical race theory, Marxist views on colonialism, and the idea that really the only remedy to colonialism is revolutionary violence. Now, if you'd asked me where this movement is going five years ago, the worst I would have thought was, you know, a divisive treaty that's going to be a sinkhole for money and unaccountable professional Aboriginal activists. But now it really does look like it's heading to a a movement that glorifies violence and I think you know a lot of blame has to be uh, has to be pointed towards uh, academics and intellectuals who feed a lot of indigenous activists critical race theory and Marxist rhetoric as they basically train them that there are no constructive uh, ways of resolving closing the gap on health on education on sexual abuse on violence and things like that. no all they've got now is violence and Nothing is going to get better with this kind of approach. It offers absolutely nothing constructive. It's the legitimising of what happened to Israel that uh, I think is just inspiring more and more people to think, oh, well, my cause is so just, uh, so great that uh, it's justified. Uh, Garth Hamilton, uh, I was going to give uh, Senator Don Farrell, the trade minister, Labor trade minister, a whack today. He said something quite extraordinary uh, in the Senate, that the US is not Australia's most trusted ally, uh, I thought he was on the right wing of the Labor Party. He's singling out New Zealand instead. Here he is. Minister, why is the Albanese Labor government acting in opposition to the United States, our most trusted international partner? Well, I, I take issue with your original or your, your, your first statement there. I'm not sure that the United States is, is our most trusted uh, uh, ally. I, I would have said New Zealand in the whole history of time, the whole history of time is our, yes, yeah. Well, you can trust New Zealand not to come to our rescue uh, if we're in real trouble. That's what you can trust New Zealand for. If even Don Farrell of the right is backing away from the US, oh dear. But then Don Farrell, uh, this insulting remark for an Indigenous Greens senator, here he is. Outside of your gas donors, who did the government consult with specifically regarding Schedule 2, Part 2 of this bill, and specifically which First Nations groups were consulted and over what period of time? This, this government doesn't apologise for um, continuing to support the, uh, the, the, the gas uh, industry and ensure that the lights stay on so that even basket weavers like yourself, Senator Cox, can have light uh, at Minister night time. Farrell, Minister Farrell, withdraw that comment. A basket weaver, Garth Hamilton, uh, someone, uh, you know, a s simplistic, uh, you know, unsophisticated living, uh, fair enough or a little bit too close to the bone? 
look, I never thought I'd say this and I will never say it again, but bring back Penny Wong. Uh, Don Farrell's in there replacing her while she's away. Uh, goodness me. You know, on the, on, the, on the US comment about them not being our most trusted ally, mm. that's a significant departure uh, for Australia. I and I, so. I don't think that's the government's position. But, look, we've just seen this government, you know, tear Australia apart in a very divisive uh, referendum on The Voice. And now we're seeing senior frontbenchers use this sort of language in Parliament, nonetheless. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that what they say and what they do line up terribly well, Andrew. A, a bad day for Don Farrell, Steve Trevura? Oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think given, you know, the rise of China in the uh, in our region, uh, anything that would diminish our uh, relationship with the U.S. is a pretty bad move. And the basket weaver comment, the closest thing I can think of that is when Paul Keating uh, uh, spoke about Balmain basket weavers from memory, uh, referring to sort of mm -hmm. inner city elites or something like that. And look, uh, it just, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that this bloke just doesn't get away with it because he doesn't have Paul Keating's well, that little bit of charm that he had, a little bit, not much. Yeah, I thought his uh, comments on America were quite extraordinary. Um, by the way, uh, we've had, Garth, we've had so many reasons from the COVID-19 scare to distrust what government claims is true. You know, no, lockdowns were, in fact, not always sensible at all. And no, the virus was very, very rarely spread outdoors. And now long COVID is nothing more than a normal thing you can get after a cold or a flu. Here's the scare and then Queensland's chief health officer last week. Long COVID. Long COVID. Long COVID clinics. Long COVID. Long COVID. Long COVID. Queensland's chief health officer is calling for the term long COVID to be scrapped. We could identify no difference in the outcomes of patients with COVID or other respiratory infection. Yeah, Garth, what does it tell you? Look, I think there's a long way to go in the conversation and I... I can't help but be reminded of Ronald Reagan's phrase, trust but verify. You know, I think trust in a government is a good thing. I think it should be earned. And I think once you establish it, it's the basis of a great relationship with the people and those that they elect to lead them. But that verification part's quite important. You know, I was a big supporter of having a Royal Commission into uh, COVID and government's response to COVID over the last couple of years. And I think that's one of the checks and balances that we have in our system of government to make sure that we can trust the government to make sure that trust we put in them is well placed. And I think it's been a terrible, terrible decision by this Albanese government uh, to strip that Royal Commission right back and exclude the actions of the states who arguably played the biggest uh, part of government intervention during that time. So they've taken away the, I think, an See, essential part of what makes a democracy strong. Yep, you're quite right. Garth Hamilton, Steve Trevura, thank you very much to you both. After the break, former pop star Holly Valance pays out global warming guru Greta Thunberg. But in Finland, a young university student with a gun takes the Thunberg message too far. Our biggest problem now, I think, is that we're losing the ability to disagree with each other without hatred or now even violence, whether it's Gaza or race politics generally or global warming, one thing keeps coming through. Extremes of all three causes claim their cause is so great that they are excuse anything for some, even terrorism, to force us to agree with them, even global warming with motorists stopped and paintings destroyed because, you know, global warming is going to kill us all because doesn't guru Greta Thunberg say exactly that? People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. Yeah, luckily, a lot of people are now starting to see through this, like former pop star Holly Valance. Like, I don't understand why you have this, like, demonic little gremlin high priestess of climatism as the goddess in classrooms, Greta. Greta Thunberg, OK. And the kids are all coming home with depression and anxiety. Why would you go to your music lesson or bother doing your homework it's or get sad. out of bed if you think we're all going to be dead in five years anyway? I mean, they told me in class. Greta told me. Um, why would you bother? doesn't give anybody hope. But some others just get more extreme. Like this 23-year-old Finnish student last week who was arrested after taking the Thunberg message to the next step. Stop this hunger for money. 
growth and personal profits. It's not sustainable, it's selfish and it's disgusting. The course is not changing for better. I will target a school because those people are where we should draw the line. For personal reasons, I wanted to do this in the high school I graduated from, but it's not practical and also this isn't about me. This will be used to make a change. I think it's beautiful. Joining me from London is Esther Kraku, broadcaster, author, commentator, and so much more. Esther, thank you for your time. Tell people often enough that the global warming is destroying their planet and humanity. Is it really then surprising? Some people think extreme measures are called for. Yes, the problem is with a lot of these movements, we've we've empowered clearly the, pe the people that should be on the fringes, the clearly mentally unwell that think that they've used the cause celebre or the cause du jour uh, to effectively find a new identity, find a new club to identify with. And these people are not really interested in talking about the, the real issues. I mean, the fact that Greta Thunberg, as a 15-year-old girl, was being trotted around at UN conventions as somehow the 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 the, the high priestess, <laughs> to quote uh, Holly Valens, of, of, of climate change is Ludicrous. And yet, on, on, on the same way, we have someone like Shamima Begum here in the UK, a 15-year-old who joined a terrorist organization. Somehow, we shouldn't take her seriously because apparently she didn't know what she did. Uh, but we should take the words of Greta Thunberg at 15 years old seriously. The problem is we can't agree with each other because we keep highlighting and we keep uh, promoting insane voices, people that don't understand actually the risks and, and rewards of, of these kinds of things that we're discussing. For example, people talk about, you know, most scientists or the vast majority of scientists, published scientists agree on climate change. Well, yes, because you can't get published if you don't agree with the, the, the current orthodoxy. So you do have scientists presumably that don't necessarily agree with a lot of the, the, the climate change science that's going around, but they, 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 we can't hear from them because they will not get published. We know this for a fact. Um, and, and instead of us to have a frank and open conversation about it, we, we tend to elevate weird, ludicrous voices and expect the rest of us to buy into it and sacrifice our standards of living and basically go into poverty because of something that a 15-year-old Swedish girl said. Spot on, spot on. Esther, what more does Britain have to do to prove it's not racist? You know, it's, you're still flagellating yourselves over there. All its top political leaders on the mainland are now people of colour. Now that the Welsh First Minister is a man with a Zambian mum, Scotland's Chief Minister is Muslim of Pakistani background, and the Prime Minister of Britain has, of course, has of course got Indian heritage. What do you conclude from all of this? It concludes that no matter your colour, you can still be a pretty mediocre politician. <laughs> because at the end of the day, that's what they are. <laughs> Look, we, 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 can, we can accept that Britain is, is in many ways a post-racial society and ha has done a lot more progress on, on, on racism um, than most countries in the world, even though most people don't want to acknowledge it. But the fundamental point is these politicians are still very mediocre. You know, Wales is run like a complete dumpster fire. Labour councils have put up council tax by over 2,000% in the last 10 years because they haven't had to vote on it, except unlike here in England where councils have to vote on it which is why you see Birmingham City Council and Nottingham Council and Croydon Council all going bankrupt. Uh, so the reality is these politicians no matter their skin colour, their creed, their ethnicity, they're still mediocre. The mediocrity has been shared around. I'm out of time but I just need to quickly ask is being Anglo now uh, in England a political drawback? Uh, in, in some ways uh, but again it wouldn't make much of a difference because I think we can all agree that the caliber of our politicians is not where it should be. Uh, I think racial equality now means spreading the mediocrity around, which is quite sad. And the, the biggest losers <laughs> are the British people. All right. <laughs> That's the great stuff. Thank you so much. That's it from me. Thank you, Esther Kraku. Up next is Sharon. <laughs>